Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we're going to have a really important uh, discussion about uh, Zionism with Valeria Chazan. <laughs> Chazin, <laughs> sorry. Valeria Chazin is the co founder and chair of the board of directors of Students Supporting Israel, a nonprofit with chapters on campuses across, across North America with the mission to be a clear and confident voice for Israel and promote grassroots activism. Valeria grew up in Rehovot, Israel, and after completing her military service, moved to Minneapolis. She earned a Bachelor of Science degree in business and marketing from the University of Minnesota and is a graduate of William Mitchell College of Law. Valeria is the represent of several national activism awards. She is a pro bono attorney and she and has been involved as a volunteer with several Jewish and non-Jewish community organizations. Thank you Valeria for coming today. As always, um, you can um, submit your questions in the chat during the presentation and we will uh, answer all of them at the end. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Adi. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here and to speak to you and to get to know you this morning. Thank you, Karen, for the invitation to um, for this program. So before I'll share my screen with you, I have a little presentation, uh, PowerPoint to share with you. But just uh, like Karen said, um, I am the uh, co-founder of Student Supporting Israel. We are based in Minnesota. I'm speaking to you from Minnesota right now. And we're working on college campuses. Now, this presentation was developed after we were talking to so many college students for the years since we were active on campuses. And we realized that a lot of students, they want to be active for Israel, but they actually don't know the very basics, uh, the core of what Zionism even means, uh, what is the, the very um, definition of Zionism. And basically, they, they really cannot place sometimes, you know, themselves on this line of uh, great Jewish activists and the history of Zionism. And that's where we created this uh, lecture about the history of modern Zionism. And there are, of course, lectures and volumes of history books that can be um, read and that were written about the topic. But uh, this specific lecture is focusing more on the very uh, foundations, like why even Zionism uh, started as a modern political movement, you know, what is, um, what were the reasons for it? So something that's very simple to explain, I think, to, uh, to, you know, high school students, to teenagers, something that will um, help them realize where they're at. I realized that you um, probably know much more than the average college students when I, when I usually do this uh, lecture. So when I do this presentation to the community, I always say, take this as talking points to spread the message of Zionism more. And maybe you will also learn something new here too. So I will share my screen with you right now. Um, Here, just one second. Let me know if you can see this. Okay, wonderful. So the history of modern Zionism, again, we're students supporting Israel. If you want to check later what we're doing, so our website is right here. It's ssimovement.org. So again, what we want to do, you know, maybe uh, I'm thinking that for you, you probably know the first part of, of the goals of this class. So uh, increase your own uh, understanding of the Jewish identity. I'm sure you're familiar with that. But the second part, this is what I want to focus more whenever we speak to the community. And it's really um, try to translate your knowledge to activism, like pass whatever we're going to be talking right now on to your community, to the people who are less involved, who are usually not attending the Zoom sessions or the lectures. and Whenever I start talking about Zionism uh, on college campuses, I usually ask students, do you consider yourself a Zionist? And believe it or not, uh, my last two lectures, one of them was at the Chabad house in front of college students. The other one was at a teen, like Jewish teen fellowship. It was like a Sunday program. 
And one person in the two groups combined, it was maybe 50 students, one student raised their hand to say they considered themselves as Zionist before this presentation even started. And I think this is a big problem uh, for the, you know, especially for, for the generation of foreign students, it's a big problem when students cannot say confidently they are Zionists. This is why we need to educate them about, you know, what is this even mean, you know, and I think the main thing about this uh, presentation is really to know the definition, but also to know how it all came to be. Okay, so uh, again, like I, I realize that some of this may be known to you, but it's important to understand that this will be great talking points to the outside um, world who do not understand this whole thing. So first of all, we'll start, what is even the origin of the word Zionism? And of course, this is comes this comes from the word Zion, Zion, right? And then what is Zion? Zion is literally a synonym for a description of the land. This is the land of Israel, Zion. And then just to um, see a few examples that we really know about them from our everyday lives, but we may not necessarily thought of it this way, right? So when we're thinking about our national anthem, Hatik of Israel, at the very uh, last two sentences, it says, to be free people in our land, the land of Zion and Jerusalem. And that basically, you know, comes to say, well, when we're saying the word Zion, we're talking about a piece of land. Uh, our land, the Holy Land, you know, where Jerusalem is. By the way, the, I don't know if you knew that, but the original two uh, last sentences of Hatiko were different. It was changed, but the original uh, words written by Naftali Heotzimbar were to be free people in our land, the land where David was, uh, the, where the city of David was. Basically, just another example to show how Zion means Jerusalem, means the land of Israel. Then, Whenever, uh, for example, in Jewish traditions, right, we break the glass under the chuppah, where this tradition is taken from, when we, whenever we say, So this is actually taken from Salem. Um, and in this song of Salem, it starts with, uh, by the water of Babylon, we sat down, wept as we remembered Zion. So it was after the um, exile of Babylon, uh, ex exile to Babylon about, you know, 2,500 years ago, that the Jews, uh, that this piece of, um, of Talim was written, and they were saying, they wrote it as they were remembering Zion, as they were remembering the land of Israel, and basically, this is where the tradition comes from, from the same uh, song. Now, what, what it really comes to show, right? It comes to show that the Jews over thousands of years express their yearning to Zion, they express their remembrance of Zion, of the land of Israel, but it doesn't necessarily mean we did something about it to return to this place, right? So for example, over the years, every time there's Passover, we say at the end of Passover next year in Jerusalem, but it never means that the next day we're packing our luggage and we're actually moving to Jerusalem. So. Uh, it just means we're expressing this uh, hope, right? Like the tikva, we're expressing this love to the land of Israel. But we never necessarily did something physically about it. So really over the centuries, you know, the, the diaspora Jews always maintained the strong connection, but not necessarily did something about it. But again, Zion equals basically the land of Israel. Now, what is modern Zionism? basically, because the idea of Zionism was always there, the idea that we, uh, you know, we, we remember the land of Israel, that was always there. But when modern Zionism came to be, and this is something that really became popular in the 19th century, and it took the idea of Zionism, the idea of our hope to return to Zion, and actually made this into an active movement. Now, what was so special about the 19th century that uh, Zionism as a movement, an actual call for Jews to let's return to Zion, what was so special about the 19th century? And I think modern Zionism really um, was not able to, to become what it is without you know, the, the spirits, the special circumstances of the time that started. And the question is, what were 
the needs of the time. What were the spirits of the time that really made it possible for modern Zionism to happen and to have a few Jewish leaders say, well, you know what, we have this idea. We always were yearning for the land of Israel. Now it's time for us to do something about it. And I think one big, uh, big issue here that we need to mention is the role of anti-Semitism in the creation of modern Zionism. So anti-Semitism was there all the time. And actually, I want to, to jump quickly to this one slide. Okay, so anti-Semitism, there are certain types of anti-Semitism. And there are always the classic anti-Semitism that is religious-based, right? So it's the, the whole idea of uh, Jews killed Jesus, and maybe the Jews were um, accused of making, I don't know, like matzah ball soups from Christian children. You know, there are always these blood labels that were religion-based. And that is the classic anti-Semitism, and it was present for years and years, um, thousands of years. But then something happened uh, during the enlightenment period right so in the enlightenment period in europe people became a little less religious there's more um more press more the print was starting to happen so the more liberal ideas and in, intellectual ideas started to appear right like the whole um, uh, idea in, in france they were talking about uh, human liberties like that was never something that people talked about like in the in the times of the medieval times like you, you know liberties was not even a thing and now people were suddenly talking about this whole thing but anti-semitism remained right so uh despite the intellectual uh change that was sweeping the people the anti-Semitism still remained, but it changed. So it was not so much necessarily religion-based, not that the religion-based anti-Semitism went anywhere, but there was also modern anti-Semitism. And modern anti-Semitism became more racial-based. And I think the best example to see this is, of course, the, um, in Nazi Germany, where a lot of the Jews were very assimilated and were very much part of the society, not necessarily very religious, but still they were discriminated against on the basis of race. So we're looking here at two types of uh, anti-Semitism, the classic religious one and then the modern anti-Semitism. And I think that the Jewish um, leaders who try to maybe solve the problem of Jews being a prosecuted minority through some sort of um, uh, integration into the societies, also did not succeed in this very much. So there was, a, there was a movement within the Jewish people that was called the Haskalah movement. And that was around the 18th, 19th uh, century, like beginning of the 19th century. Now, what the Haskalah movement were trying to do, the Haskalah movement was basically, uh, Haskalah in Hebrew means uh, education, so the enlight enlightenment movement. So they were saying, if we will assimilate into the societies, maybe we'll solve the Jewish problem of people hating us. But that didn't really work out, as we know. So the Haskalah movement kind of failed. And I think an example, like there is a picture here of a postcard of uh, the time, like this postcard was around 1800 or so, like the, the, uh, the late, I'm sorry, the beginning of the 19th uh, century. So you can see, you know, the, the generation of the grandfather is dressed in this very traditional Jewish uh, clothing and then the parents and the kids already dressed in a little bit more modern European uh, ways and so a lot of Jews just, just tried to assimilate, get out of the shtetl, that didn't work so still there is a lot of hate towards the religious Jewish community like little towns, little shtetls and then also race racial based hate towards uh, Jews who were more assimilated and we see that none of this like not assimilation none of this solved basically the, the enlightenment period didn't help the Jews to be more loved right by their communities and there are a lot of pogroms that were happening at that period of time here's some uh, drawings from the pogrom of Kiev in 1881 by the way my family is from Kiev originally and my great-grandfather's parents were actually killed in a pogrom like that um, just a little bit later on but around uh, 19 I think uh, one or two but um, this is you know some drawings of the pogroms that were happening here in 1882 1881 a big famous pogrom was in the city of Kishinev in 1903 
the pogrom of Kishinev. Now, why this one specifically was so uh, very famous? First of all, it was a big one. I don't know how many of you heard about the Kishinev pogrom of 1903. For sure, the college students, when I'm talking to, never heard of it. And it's something that was triggered by a blood label. And basically, a lot of um, dozens of Jewish people were killed, businesses were looted. And Chaim Nachman Bialik, the national poet of Israel, he came to the city of Kishinev after the pogrom, and he wrote a really moving and uh, terrible, uh, you know, in its strength, poem that was called The City of Slaughter. In Hebrew, it's called Ira uh, Haharega, if any, one of you heard. And this poem became very famous because of two things. Well, first of all, um, it was very vivid in its description of what happened in the pogrom. So it was really, uh, if you read the, the words, they're extremely hard to read, uh, to read the description. And second of all, it became famous because of the uh, criticism that Chaim and Nachman Bialik included in this poem saying that the Jewish community didn't do much to protect. So he was describing there the, the, the men that were hiding while their, while their women were being raped. So a very hard, um, you know, somewhat of a criticism. And again, at this time, it's already 1903, right? So we have a lot of Jewish press and uh, a lot of um, like more movement, like uh, things are a little bit more modern. So if uh, before, like say, 500 years ago, there were some pogroms of the Jewish community and it was hard to hear about and not a lot of people heard about it and in the other side of uh, Europe or somewhere else in a different Jewish community. So specifically now there's press, there are Jewish journals and this poem, for example, was widely circulated. So the Jewish community hears about, he hears about the pogroms, they're a little bit more aware of the anti-Semitism that's happening, a little bit more aware about what's going on in different communities. And I think one of the main symbol of uh, modern anti-Semitism, right? So it's racial based, was the Dreyfus affair. And by the way, the Dreyfus affair, again, something that's very important to talk uh, to, to people about, you know, and, and a lot of like, again, students just never heard of this when I'm talking to students and that's mostly what I'm doing. So uh, the Dreyfus affair, especially I think in the, in the Jewish community, in the Zionist community, considered as really this symbol of modern anti-Semitism that's not religious based. And I'll just briefly explain to, to the people who maybe have not heard about it. So what was the Dreyfus affair? Basically, Dreyfus was the only Jewish soldier in the French, uh, in, in his French legion of, uh, or his French unit of the French army. And there was this incident that um, someone was um, suspected of, you know, giving information to the German army. And from the entire uh, unit of the soldiers, the only soldier who was Jewish was uh, picked upon and basically accused of this, uh, um, oh my God, uh, of this uh, betrayal of the French, right? And you see here the Dreyfus, he was basically feeling that he is uh, very French, like he's a very French man, right? Like he's a Jewish uh, person, but he's French but he was the one who was picked and chose to be accused of um, betrayal. And what happened is that this photo is of uh, this drawing as of the um, moment where his, uh, his, uh, oh my God, in Hebrew, I have it. Um, all the medals, you know, all his um, basically military rankings were stripped from him and it was a public uh, square, right? So the situation was that uh, his sword was breaking, so everything was taken from him. He was uh, jailed. And when this was happening in a public square in France, now you need to understand the situation. So not a lot of people were allowed into the square, uh, into the public square to see this happening, but behind the gates of the square were a lot of people, a lot of French mob yelling, kill the Jews, you know, and death to the Jews and a lot of anti-Semitic slurs during the Dreyfus affair. And only a few journalists were allowed to be inside this, to, to watch this. And one of the journalists who was allowed to be there was actually uh, Herzl, 
uh, the young Herzl, he was a journalist at the time, and later on, when he was writing his memoirs, he would say that him witnessing the Dreyfus uh, affair and the public, you know, uh, humiliation of this one officer, that later on, he was actually, uh, it was said that it was not true, it was just, uh, he, he was um, not the one who was, uh, there, there were some, like, documented documents that were fabricated, um, so later on, he was released years later, uh, but Herzl was writing that him being and witnessing the Dreyfus affair was one of the things that moved him to start the Zionist movement because he then realized that basically uh, assimilation is also not necessarily the answer to the Jewish problem and there is, there is a Jewish problem that's there and we need to solve it somehow. So along with Herzl, right, so along with uh, Herzl there were a few Jewish leaders at a time that were seeing this whole thing happening, that were seeing the um, big rise in modern anti-Semitism, even though these people, by the way, were not necessarily very religious themselves, and they were uh, fairly, you know, like uh, journalists, um, activists, so they're very much not necessarily living in their state and they're more traveling the world. What they saw is that anti-Semitism is not going anywhere despite the enlightenment and we need to do something about this. So just a few other examples of leaders who were uh, there at the time. Uh, Moses Hass was a big um, leader. He was shaken by, by a blood label in Damascus, by the way. Um, Pinsker, Leon Pinsker, uh, was very much shook by the pogroms of 80, 1881 and 82 that uh, I previously shared their graphics of, and they're all saying, okay, we need to do something about the Jewish problem, which is again a problem of uh, a, basically a prosecuted minority, you know, that no matter where we go, there is, uh, can't, uh, can't be completely um, safe and free of hate. So Herzl is of course considered to be the father of modern Zionism, and in um, this, this famous photo of him in the balcony of the uh, hotel he was staying uh, were, were during the first Zionist Congress. So now again, in 87, he organized the first Zionist Congress, right, which met in Basel. And there are a lot of delegates from across the different Jewish communities that came together and they're basically saying, okay, how are we going to solve the Jewish problem? And what the modern Zionists called is for, let's realize this idea of return to the land of Israel. So we're not just gonna be saying in Passover next year in Jerusalem and not do anything about it, but we're actually gonna start and working towards this goal, towards making it happen. And he, they were calling for the political recognition of a Jewish homeland. So they said, we need to start to create a home for the Jewish people to be sovereign, and to be uh, masters of their own faith. Now, just to kind of recap, right? So we're talking about, uh, again, the Jewish problem, uh, the problem of a minority that we just don't know how to solve, and the Zionism, the Zionism, modern Zionist movement, basically wanted to realize this return to the historic homeland of the Jewish people. Now, uh, again, one interesting thing is we can talk, right? We're talking about, um, the, the um, uh, circumstances, right, around the 19th century that specifically made it happen, the rise of the modern Zionism. And one thing, of course, is the modern anti-Semitism, uh, the racial base, but then another thing is also the, the national movements, right? So Herzl, it's not that he came to this idea, right, and Zionist leader of, oh, we need a Jewish state for the Jewish people. They didn't just, uh, come to this idea out of nowhere, but it was actually very much in sync with the nationalism feelings that were uh, becoming more popular across Europe at the time. So at the time, um, in the 19th century, there are a lot of nationalist movements sweeping through Europe. And the French, you know, were saying, well, we want France uh, as a French country, and the German were saying the same, and the English were saying so. So nationalistic feeling was something, you know, the, the idea of like a national home for for people, for such a type of people, was something that uh, was a fairly popular idea 
at the time. And that's where the Zionist leaders also took it from. Now, a quote, you know, from Daniel Gordis, uh, he wrote several books, several great books. I recently read his uh, biography of uh, Menachem Begin, he was a great writer, but he wrote about nationalism the following. There is nothing about nationalism that means that it must become ugly or dangerous. Nationalism can simply be the community's expression of the self-esteem and sense of history that every human being needs in, or needs in order to function, thrive, love, and ultimately give. So why am I bringing it here? Because I think when today I'm giving this presentation and I'm saying, you know, uh, the Zionist movement is basically some sort of a national Jewish movement to build an independent Jewish state. And the word nationalism is taken as, as a really bad word today, especially by, by students, you know, um, on college campuses, because they're right straight uh, thinking about um, like white nationalism or just something that's racist. But what is important to explain when we're talking about Zionism is that there is nothing about Zionism that's racist, because if you read Herzl's book, he wrote a book that was called um, the Judenstadt, the Ju Jewish state, where he envisioned his, um, you know, vision for an independent Jewish state. He actually um, outlined, you know, his vision for a state where the Jews are majority and minorities are treated equally and they're equal under the law. So uh, when you look at the Zionism idea, it's something that seeks to establish uh, a state that's, uh, you know, where the Jews are sovereign and uh, they're the masters of their own faith, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a racist place because minorities can live in this place and minorities can have the same protection under the law. And by the way, in Israel, um, there is a citizenship class that every uh, student in high school needs to take as Rachut, and we're taking like a final, um, you know, for a final like a uh, diploma for high school, one of the things we need to take um, a test in is, is a citizenship test, where basically there is a thick book, and when it comes to the the uh, type of country, you know, Israel is, it really talks about the fact how you know uh, the Jewish country is there, and it's for the Jewish people to be sovereign in the land of Israel, but also it's for other people, so it's not a racist thing to uh, be a Zionist, to support Zionism. And that's something that I feel like today, uh, you know, with all these accusations, it's very important to actually uh, know how to talk about this part of Zionism. So uh, now what are the goals? What were the goals of nationalism in general, right? So two things, uh, there are two things, is liberation of the people we want, like uh, it's a national movement, we want liberation and we want unity. So we want, for example, we don't want to be uh, in the diaspora and just spread around the world. We want to be united, everybody together. So Zionist leaders, they basically wanted to, to bring and to realize the two goals uh, of the nationalism for, for the Jewish people. They want liberation. They didn't want to be under other uh, countries. And they also wanted unity and basically um, they wanted to free, right, the Jewish people. I'll just read, read to you what it says here, right? They wanted to free the Jews from a hostile and oppression environments uh, in other country and to gather the Jewish from all the exiles uh, in a Jewish homeland. Now, did it mean they want to bring every single Jew around the planet to Israel? Not necessarily, right? But they did want to at least unite the Jews more. This is what the early Zionist leaders really wanted. Now, basically, when we're talking about what is then the definition of Zionism. So the definition that I always like to use, because you know, sometimes people are asking like, oh, what is Zionism? And, and people say, oh, Zionism is the love of Israel, or Zionism is like uh, my, I don't know, like my love of the of Israel, I'm pro-Israel. But well, it doesn't really mean much, to be honest, because um, I think a more uh, precise definition for Zionism will be to say Zionism is the national liberation movement of the Jewish people. It's basically the movement uh, to to have sovereignty for the Jewish people, to be a nation among all nations that uh, deserves, you know, a place to call home in the world, a place where we can be uh, with self-government and just rule our own, you know? So, so that's pretty much the definition that I love to use for Zionism. And I really encourage everybody to use this definition too. So... 
uh, I'll skip this one. So something interesting when we're talking about Zionism, right? So you know how we like to say two Jews, three opinions. So the question is, is Zionism is something that was just this one movement where everybody agreed and everybody just knew, well, we want to establish the state of Israel and that's how we're going to do it and that's how it's going to look like. Like, no. Zionism was actually a very plural, it is still like a, a very pluralistic movement, but especially in the early days too, when the early Zionist Congress and I would say, you know, when I have a chalkboard or something, so I always drew, I draw a little circle and I say, well, this is the goal. The goal is to establish the state of Israel. And on that goal, everybody agreed. I think all the Zionist leaders agreed that we need to establish a, a Jewish state. But how to get there and how the state is going to be looking like after the creation, on that there are many different opinions among the Zionist leaders. and here I just included six of the early Zionist leaders that I think are um, more, you know, prominent and especially the two in the middle. I think we can recognize the two in the middle. So we have uh, David Ben-Gurion and we have Zev Jabotinsky there as the socialist Zionism and the uh, revisionist Zionism. Basically, what was the revisionist Zionism? They wanted to revise the Zionism that was proposed uh, before because they wanted to revise and do it a little differently. And we have all these different um, branches of Zionism and they all had a different, quite different idea about how to get to the state of Israel. So for example, we can see it even by the uh, fighting forces, right? So for example, David Ben-Gurion and the social Zionism, I would say under this uh, leadership was the Haganah movement that was uh, working to fight for the state of Israel before the establishment. It was kind of fighting the British and uh, they were uh, defending the Yeshuv. And then we have under Zev Jabotinsky, we had the Etzel and the more, a little bit more militaristic um, like groups. And because they all had a different vision of how we should get to the state of Israel. And arguably they all were pieces of the puzzle of eventually making this happen, right? Making the state of Israel come uh, there. Now, there are also other, like the religious Zionism of the Rav Kook, you know, there was um, Artun Rupin and Chaim Weizmann, who was the first president of Israel too, but he had his own little vision of Zionism. And I think the two in the middle, right? So we can see them as the more dominant because obviously Ben-Gurion is the first prime minister and he's a, uh, party was for a very long time, the, the leadership party of the state of Israel after establishment. And then we have Zev Jabotinsky that uh, his followers, you know, Begin and later on uh, Shamir. And now it's basically the Likud party where now Netanyahu is the head of the Likud party. So right now it's more, I would say, this side of the Zionist movement that's in charge of, um, or in the majority of the Israeli uh, politics. But we see all these different branches. And so there was not necessarily an agreement before the state of Israel was created, and there's not necessarily an agreement even now after the state of Israel is already created about how to run the state, right? So um, discussions like we're saying the state of Israel is a Jewish and democratic state, and the discussion is what is the balance between Jewish and democratic was something that was happening among the Zionist movement before the creation of Israel, and it's something that's happening even now. And a lot of other other issues that were a topic before the creation of the state of Israel and basically the Zionists, uh, the early Zionists were really occupied with. It's still, uh, these are still issues that are occupying the current Israeli leadership and uh, you know it's all about the balances uh, between a lot of issues but this is all a mosaic you know and a puzzle and all these uh, Zionist leaders came together to create the one big picture of the Zionist movement. But that's important also to say, also to teach, I think, and, and communicate that Zionism is actually a fairly diverse ideology, but everybody agree on the very base that we do need a Jewish state for the Jewish people. So this is the very base. So now with the creation of the state of Israel, there basically it marked the realization of the idea of the, of the modern uh, Zionist leaders, right? They, they created the state of Israel. And the question is, I think, now, now I will skip many years, you know, and again, this is just a 30 minutes presentation. There's so much to learn. There's so, so fascinating 
um, so much fascinating information and history about what happened during this many years since the first Zionist Congress in Basel and to the establishment of the State of Israel. Uh, of course, you know, there are so many events to Jewish people like the Holocaust. There, there's so many things to learn about. We'll skip this. We'll, we'll come to the now the realization of the uh, idea of the modern Zionism with the establishment of the State of Israel. And the question then remains, you know, after the establishment of the State of Israel, what is the work of the Zionists today? Like why now in 2020, I consider myself a Zionist. You're part of um, an organization, you know, that has a Zionist in its name. So you're a Zionist. So why are we still Zionists today? And how do we explain it, I think, to, to other people who don't, who just can't really understand what's the uh, work of Zionism today? And first of all, I want to talk about really the existential question, the uh, question of is the Jewish people, uh, oh, I'm sorry, is the state of Israel is an absolute guarantee, you know? So I think a lot of people today are taking the state of Israel for granted. So when we're thinking about the early Zionists, they didn't have the state of Israel. They were, they were uh, hoping to create the state of Israel. Some of them didn't live to see this happen. But we now have um, a strong state of Israel that's 70 years old. And for many people, um, especially I would say college age and younger, you know, they really take the state of Israel sometimes for granted. They can't imagine a word, world because they were not born in that time where, where the state of Israel was not a thing. And the question is, is the state of Israel is the guarantee. And we just look, I think, at the world history and countries, uh, you know, become countries and countries fall and empires, you know, build and fall. And the state of Israel is not going anywhere tomorrow and not in the next, uh, you know, many years, I hope. But there are, in fact, existential threats to Israel. And one of them that I think a lot of Israeli politicians keep talking about is Iran. And these are just, um, you know, headlines from, uh, like what, a few months ago saying nothing will be left of Israel, right, says Iran, and uh, if like Israel will be destroyed in a matter of an hour. So if you ask what is something that occupies the Israeli uh, military, so different threats, like physical threats to Israel, there's something that still exists. You know, we still don't have peace with our neighbors. We still have threats from Gaza, and we still have threats from Syria and from Lebanon and from different places. So a physical threat, I'm not saying like it will wipe Israel uh, from being a country, but physical threats to Israel exist. And we still do need to explain to people why it's important to have a physical state of Israel that's, um, you know, safe and secure. And it's actually still a thing. So that's one thing I think it's the job of, um, of you know, a lot of Zionist people is to explain, well, you know, we do need a, a strong Israel because we need a secure place for the Jewish people, for a lot of Israelis. But then uh, when we're talking specifically about, you know, the, the Zionism movement today, like what are some of our goals? And I think post the creation of Israel, three main goals. And the first one is to continue encourage the in gathering of the exiles, right? We're talking before that the, the idea of Zionism is to have unity and bring people together, Jewish people together from different areas of the world. So, but here we were talking about, you know, for example, helping endangered Jewish communities. And I don't know, by the way, how many of you knew that the Mossad, the Israeli Mossad, is the only uh, agency from uh, around the world that has in its mission, uh, the, the so in its mission, there's also the, the uh, duty not only to protect the citizens of its own country, but also to protect other citizens of other countries but Jewish communities, okay? So, so the Mossad is the only, uh, like, uh, intelligence, you know, um, agency that's there also protecting Jewish communities that are not citizens of Israel. So you don't have, for example, um, some, uh, I don't know, country that's a Christian, protecting Christian communities necessarily in other places as an official, you know, governmental agency. You maybe have NGOs, but the Mossad is actually there, and the Mossad is, in fact, uh, for example, very, very much, um, you know, responsible for different secret and interesting, amazing operations, bringing in and helping Jewish communities uh, around the world who suffered from anti-Semitism. 
So this continuing of, you know, bringing the Jewish people together. And then the second goal of Zionism today is to preserve the unity among the Jewish people. I think this is very important because right now, you know, we have, uh, I think we're reading every day on the news about, for example, how the Israeli Jewish community and the American Jewish community, uh, you know, growing in their differences, their different arguments. It's so important. One of the thing of the goals of the Zionists today is to basically help and um, preserve the unity between the different Jewish communities around the world. So the divide won't grow. And then the last thing is to educate about the centrality of Israel in Jewish life. It's so important because I think a lot of, uh, right now, a lot of times we're seeing this attempt to say, well, it's okay, one thing is, Jewish is one thing, but Israeli, it's another thing, you know? So you can be a Jewish, but, and that's okay, we're okay with you being Jewish, but we're not okay with you supporting Israel. Well, this is ridiculous because actually Israel is central. The land of Israel, you know, the land of Zion is central to the Jewish identity everywhere. And so to educate about the centrality is extremely important. And I think this is what we're doing right now. This is at least what I am doing uh, all the time in my job and students supporting Israel, talking to students about this. I think especially with the, with the younger generation, it's just, um, it's a hard conversation because it's something that a lot of uh, Jewish institutions even are not necessarily having these conversations. You know, they're talking about Judaism, Jewish values, Jewish holidays, but because the subject of Israel can be a little bit um, like sensitive, you know, so they don't necessarily want to discuss this. Because, and this is wrong. Like, uh, it's, it's so important to discuss about the centrality of Israel to uh, the Jewish people. Now, a quick, quick one uh, note, you know, about anti-Semitism. So we're talking about the religious anti-Semitism, the classic anti-Semitism that was there for thousands of years. And in the last maybe two, three hundred years, there was a modern anti-Semitism that's more racial-based, not so much religion-based, more racial-based. And then uh, after the creation of the State of Israel, there is one more type of anti-Semitism that in the Zionist community we're talking about, and this is really today's anti-Semitism uh, that is opposing to Zionism and the State of Israel. And this can also be anti-Semitic. Now the question is, you know, is, a po is criticizing the state of Israel anti-Semitic? And well, of course not, you know, if it's a legitimate criticism, there are a lot of people who live in Israel who criticize uh, different Israeli policies uh, on a daily basis, you know, in their uh, demonstrations and they're like uh, in the Knesset, people argue all the time. So it's okay to criticize. The question is when a criticism of Israel really crosses the line and, you know, criticism of Zionism becomes also by itself anti-Semitic. And Natan Shiransky, who was a prisoner in the USSR and was the head of the uh, Jewish agency, he came up with a test that's called the 3D test. And I think it's really important for, for us to know that uh, because this is basically a criteria to when criticism of Zionism and of Israel kind of crosses the line to become anti-Semitic in nature. And the three things he's talking about is when this criticism is delegitimizing the state of Israel, demonizing it, or shows double standard. Okay, so delegitimizing means like it just won't exist. And I think this, this um, little picture is taken from some um, uh, Arab like, news or website, I forgot what it is, but it's basically kind of showing how, you know, th the Jewish aspect of the land is completely being removed. So it's not like the Israeli flag, the, the, uh, there is the, the Jewish star from the land of Israel being removed. So just delegitimizing the very existence of the state of Israel. Then demonizing it, of course, to say, you know, Israel is the devil, like a lot of conspiracy theories, like it's now spreading the coronavirus. That's there uh, all over the, the web right now. Uh, a lot of conspiracy theories, you know, demonizing the state of Israel, which is pretty anti-Semitic. And then double standard, I think double standard, probably the best example is to look at the United Nations, where I think, uh, you know, in the past, like uh, th there is this um, organization, it's called, um, oh my God, uh, U UN Watch. And the head of the organization, they're watching the United Nations, that he was just uh, recently saying how just in 2019, there were, I'm trying to find it quickly here on my phone, I just can't find it, but he was basically saying how um, the, there were some number of resolutions against different countries around the world. And obviously a, a crazy number, you know, a huge, the most amount of resolutions 
were against Israel and not against any other country in the world that's clearly, you know, sometimes violating human rights. But basically the bias and the double standards was, towards Israel was so bad that it's really anti-Semitic at this point. You know, so it's important to know and to call out when the criticism of Zionism and the state of Israel crosses the line and it's actually very um, much anti-Semitic. And speaking of the UN, so big uh, damage was done when resolution 3379 was passed in the UN in 75 that said that Zionism is racism and it's a form of racism. Now, this resolution made so much damage that to this day, a lot of uh, anti-Zionist uh, voices and uh, activists, they're using this and this poster right uh, next to this red poster basically was taken from Columbia University just three years ago, major university saying, you know, having a full week about Zionism is racism. And it is all started from, you know, this resolution that was passed by the United Nations in 75. By the way, important for you, whenever you hear about this resolution, this resolution was revoked. It was revoked in 91. But it didn't matter a lot because until today, a lot of anti-Zionists, um, you know, and Israel haters are citing this resolution as some sort of authority, despite the fact that it was revoked. So it's just important to know. And then again, like we're saying, why am I stressing so much to know exactly the definition of anti-Semitism? Because especially right now in the age of, you know, social media, there's so much misinformation spread on the web and on college campuses. But I think it's it's more relevant right now, especially that there's no, uh, everything is, you know, online. A lot of anti-Semitic, um, anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist content on the web, in, in all social media platforms. It's important to know. And this one uh, poster on the left of the screen, right, that says anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism is circulating on a lot of anti-Israel groups, just taken recently, I just found it recently and just uh, was created a few years ago. Now, if you look closely, it says it tries like under the big letters, it tries in small letters to define, right? Like what is Zionism? So for example, it says anti-Zionism and then the definition reads, it's equal opposition to the Israeli Jewish ethnocratic and oppressive occupation of Palestine. Okay, this is how they define Zionism. So like, this is wrong, okay? Now, anti-Semitism, there, there's, so basically, if we know the definition of Zionism, we can write a comment correcting this poster, correcting this spread of misinformation by the very, by the very you know, definition. So there's a lot of, um, you know, posters like Israel provokes anti-Semitism. So Israel is the one who provokes anti-Semitism. And this is ridiculous, but this is actually circulating all over the web. And this is just a tiny sample of the whole misinformation that's there. And this is, I think, why it's so important. It's like our duty as Zionists to be informed of definitions of history, to be able to proactively, hopefully, you know, correct these things um, online. On college campuses, uh, what I'm doing, you know, so just last year when college was still in person uh, for, in, you know, for events, extracurricular events. So just this year, there was uh, in Urbana-Champaign, uh, and this is just one example, it's like a drop in the sea of events that are happening on college campuses. There was a huge student government resolution that declared that anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. And you know what's funny? the student government did not consult a single Jewish or Zionist student about this. A single Jewish or Zionist student. So the Jewish community in, on this campus, including our students, we have a chapter there, and including you know, other uh, organizations, they did a major walkout and they said, well, you will not define for us what anti-Zionism is. You know, because it's, it's a thing these days, like for example, a lot of communities, they're saying, well, we are the ones who define for ourselves what offends us, you know, what is the definition of our, who we are, what's our identity. And the Jewish community, the Zionist community should say the same, you know, we will define what crosses the line when this is anti-Semitic. Uh, it's very important for the Jewish students on college campuses to speak up, to not let this thing happen, you know. And uh, this was just from, Last year too, at the University of Minnesota, here, I'm in this photo there in the back, by the way, like there was a major um, 
event, a convention of a group that was called Students for Justice in Palestine at the University of Minnesota. They did their annual um, conference. We also have annual conferences for students from all over the country. They have theirs. It was here in Minnesota and a lot of the content there was extremely anti-Semitic. And of course, they were bashing the state of Israel. And we were outside of the building with a big poster saying, you know, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, the way you present it. And talking to the people who were uh, walking by uh, to explain why, you know, why this is a basically hate convention there. Uh, that's not just about criticism, a legitimate criticism to Israel, you know, but it's really an anti-Semitic thing. So just to wrap up, um, you know, I think, the most important thing for me really is for when I, when I you know, talk to college students, as I tell them is for you to get to know more about the topic so it will build your identity so much, you'll be so confident in your identity that you'll be able to speak up. I do believe that uh, here, I believe that you are definitely uh, very much know a lot of these things, you know, and, and uh, in definitely very confident about your identity, but it's just very important. I call you to, you know, make sure not to keep this knowledge to yourself like uh come if you see some criticism on social media make sure you're commenting and you're correcting misinformation that's spread make sure you're talking to your community members and people who are not involved specifically in, in students supporting israel our job is actually not so much to target the jewish community because our target audience is actually the uh the wide campus community and we're our target audience is uh the people who are not zionist people who don't know much about israel is the 95 percent of students who just walk by and have no idea and we just educate them about this so the first hopefully impression uh they hear about zionism that it's a legitimate you know it's a beautiful movement and we have a lot of books you know that we're trying to spread to educate people about this so it's really, really important just not to keep it to yourself. But actually, a lot of times when I talk to people who are already, you know, um, Zionist and uh, just not necessarily feeling comfortable talking about this in the open. So I always say, well, we'll feel very comfortable. Like, please talk about this openly. Please talk about, you know, your beliefs, the fact that we do support the right of the Jewish people to have a sovereign country and nation, you know, in today's world, because it's very important to speak up. Like, if we will be... Um, quiet then well i mean if we won't say anything like uh no one will do it for us so that's my um you know that's my i think uh conclusion for this and if you have any questions or any comments i'll be happy to have a few minutes for that laria thank you so much um we really appreciate you coming um and and speaking with us today um Of course. I'm just going to try to spot, mm -hmm. uh, stop the sharing here for a sec. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. I think everyone got um, a lot of, of information, and I think it was really great. Um, and there, I just want to hit on the last thing that you were talking about, which is anti, which is anti-Semitism. And I know you work with a lot of college students. Um, I just want to hit on the fact that Baltimore Zionist District is um, working on the platform of anti-Semitism, even though our mission is to connect the Baltimore community with the state of Israel, which is something that we do on a daily basis. Um, we do work a lot with regard to anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. Um, in fact, we just had a big um, Zoom call this past Saturday night. So if you are online on social media, on Facebook, and you do see something that is anti-Semitic, um, always feel to tag our page, Baltimore Zionist District. Um, we work with Stop Anti-Semitism so we can pass it on to them um, to help combat whatever comments you see, whatever articles you see that may be anti-Semitic in form. Um, so we work with both of those organizations. We also have a more local group um, that's called United Against Anti-Semitism, which you can be a part of, um, where we share information um, regarding things that are happening um, within our community and on a more uh, local level um, and more so in the United States um, rather than globally. Um, so that's just a few things to share that we're doing here at the BZD with regard to anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. Thank you.